as a start off, I, one of the reasons I really was excited to give this Friday Forum talk was because like the the research I've been doing for a few years is very interdisciplinary. It doesn't really have to be situated in a, the department I'm in, which is literature. Um, I come from a cultural studies um, and astronomy background. Um, and so I think that most of my argument, as I'll explain it, is rooted in cultural studies. Um, but as I've published on this, I've seen kind of like openings for, you know, like I, I think there's a feminist critique. I think that there's like um, a sociological, anthropological angle. I think that there's um, like a folkloric kind of take you could have on this topic too. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, that's why I was excited to have people from lots from different backgrounds and like um, analytic traditions to, you know, inquire and listen to some of the stuff I've been doing and then comment on it. Um, so um, I'm going to start by uh, outlining my argument and research, and then have a few definitions, and then I'm basically frame this around three different case studies, which I'll get into. Um, so the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, though ostensibly being carried out through careful scientific reasoning as how to look for extraterrestrials, is riddled with anthropomorphic assumptions, specifically imperialist and hegemonic assumptions about aliens and what they and their society, economy, and culture would look like. If we look to the way that neoliberalism has shaped our thought and culture, fears about ET map perfectly. Aliens, scientists claim, could be potential competitors for resources, presumably having left their home planet to exploit, extract, and enslave, following a pattern not dissimilar to what unfolded over centuries of capitalism. Aliens could be imperialists leaving their home planet to colonize and mold humanity to their social and political logic, like American colonial projects in Iraq, Afghanistan, and any of dozens of other countries over the past century. Uh, in the way that the SETI Institute and other astronomers and engineers talk about aliens, Aliens are projected to possess the same technological triumphalism as Silicon Valley, equating technological advancement with progress. In their theoretical hostility, aliens could have a certain machismo we lack, con being consummate corporate competitors with more so-called technology, more violence, and more willingness to use force. Um, these fears about aliens inform policy, engineering, and research at the major initiatives to search for extraterrestrial intelligence, namely the SETI Institute. Um, and we see the scientists and thinkers at these places making orientalist projections and unseen aliens as well as um, assuming all kinds of things about their societies and cultures based on the culture that they live in. There are historical examples that I'm going to get into of um, people from different eras projecting their own culturally derived, derived fears and hopes onto aliens. Um, and generally in these types of you know, case studies, you'll see a sort of a soup of his historically specific troubles blended and projected into aliens. Um, many scientists nowadays see imperialism as universal in a literal sense extending across the universe, um, and that aliens would have imperial ambitions as taken as natural to them. So, um, before we get to the three case studies, I want to start with a few definitions. So the, the phrase, the, the acronym SETI, generally uh, means search for extraterrestrial intelligence, but um, in a lot of writing, SETI is used as synecdoche for SETI Institute, which is actually, an, it's like a, it's like a nonprofit that's based in Mountain View near Google, um, and it's, it's the best funded um, effort to search for alien for extraterrestrial intelligence, um, it's all privately funded. Um, they get hundreds of millions of dollars from billionaires like Paul Allen of Microsoft, and recently um, a Russian billionaire and Stephen Hawking both donated um, what came out to hundreds of millions of dollars. Or I think it was one hundred million dollars. Um, SETI is a so SETI is a, like I said SETI is a private nonprofit. Most of their money comes from rich people, private donations. They take no government money. No government money has directly funded the search for ET since 1978 or so. Um, and so while the SETI Institute has been actively searching for um, extraterrestrial signals for 40 years, there have been 
few or no attempts to send out focused radio signals of our own towards inhabited worlds. Um, so this poses a conundrum, which is also known as the Fermi paradox. Why should humans expect aliens to send out focused hello signals of their own if we don't do it ourselves? Okay, so the, the three case studies I'm going to start with, one, the one is two are modern and one is from the uh, 19th century. Um, in 2014, there was this, this statement that was signed by a, a bunch of uh, CEOs and astronomers um, called the Medi, they called it the Medi Statement. Um, and in, uh, in the 19th century, um, there, was this, there was this big discussion or this projection of canals as existing on Mars that lots of astronomers thought and believed possibly were real. And then recently, just in the last six months, there's been all this excitement over the star that because of a very a, a weird um, light curve and how it's uh, the light that we receive from it on Earth um, is inferred, it, it's, it was thought or it was uh, projected as possibly housing what was called an alien megastructure. Um, so the phrase active SETI, as I alluded to, is uh, active SETI. It's also, also sometimes called METI, although in, in, I'm going to refer to it as active SETI because you hear that phrase more. So the active search for extraterrestrial intelligence is this idea that one must actively send out radio or other signals of some you know, form in an attempt to engage communication with aliens. Um, Douglas Vekoch at the SETI Institute explained to Slate, quote, in the past we've always assumed that any extraterrestrial civilization with the capacity to detect us will automatically make, take the initiative to make contact, sending us a powerful signal to let us know they exist. But there may be civilizations out there that refuse to reveal their existence unless we make it clear that we want to make contact. So in February 2015, there was a symposium at the American Association for the Advancement of Science Convention in San Jose where Douglas Vekoch proposed that we should stop just listening and start talking to, which is something that SETI has never done in an organized way, SETI Institute, excuse me. Um, and this, uh, this, this panel that was headed by Vekoch resulted in this huge dispute that culminated in an open letter warning of the risks of active SETI, which was signed by a lot of astronomers, but also CEOs like Elon Musk, science writer George Dyson, science fiction writer George Dyson, and another science fiction author named Paul Davies. Um, I included some of the text of the Medi statement. Um, it got a lot of uh, press. You can see it online. I think it's a uh, Berkeley hosts it. Um, some of the things that the statement says, or that that this the signatories to the statement. Uh, wrote in it include, um, ETI stands for extraterrestrial intelligence. ETI's reaction to a message from Earth cannot presently be known. We know nothing of ETI's intentions and capabilities, and it is impossible to predict whether ETI will be benign or hostile. Um, because we have just recently, in cosmic terms, attained an interstellar communications capacity, it is likely that other communicative civilizations we encounter will be millions of years more advanced than us. Um, this, I just included this slide so you could see some of the signatures, the people who signed it. I actually, I just realized um, a few days ago that the, uh, that Jeffrey Marcy signed it, which is interesting. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so uh, I just wanted to go deeper to some of the actual things that some of these signatories have said. And, and people who are anti-active SETI but didn't necessarily sign the many statement, which includes Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking did not sign that statement, but he said things basically to the effect of what that statement said. Um, so science fiction writer David Wren, we have many examples where a technologically advanced civilization contacted a technologically less advanced civilization. And in every one of those cases, there was pain, even when both sides had the best of intentions. And Stephen Hawking says, <laughs> Stephen Hawking says in an interesting, I, I think it sounds like he watched Independence Day too many times uh -huh. here. We have only to look at ourselves to see how intelligent life might develop into something we wouldn't want to meet. I imagine they might exist in massive ships, having used all the resources from their home planets. Mm -hmm. 
Such advanced aliens would perhaps become nomads, looking to conquer and colonize whatever planets they can reach. Um, and the, uh, the um, chairman of the SETI Institute is this astronomer named Seth Shostak. Sorry, it's a hard name. Too many, it's like a tongue twister name. Seth Shostak of SETI says in Slate, <laughs> Shostak agrees that we have little to lose <coughs> and possibly much to gain by reaching out. Besides, they probably already know we're here. Our radio and television broadcasts, and especially our military radar, have been leaking into space for some 70 years. There's no putting the electromagnetic cap back in the bag. Any society that's at least 100 or 200 years more advanced than we are will be able to pick up our leakage, says Shostak, unless they've stopped developing technology, which is, of course, possible. But then they're of no threat to us. Um, and this even, even the editorial board of Nature, which is one of the like sort of most reputed uh, science magazines, the Board of Nature wrote an op-ed about this, about the MIDI statement. It said, this is just a quote from it. Um, the chances of active study causing unpleasant outcomes with today's technology are in fact remote, as this would require us to lift ourselves over the threshold of detectability for an alien civilization that just happened to be orbiting the star at which the message was aimed, or to reveal some peculiar flaw in our psychological makeup that alien black ops specialists might start working out ways to exploit Either way, the harm, even if done at the speed of light, would take decades to arrive. Um, yeah, I was I was really impressed that they would mention so, like that these assumptions about what aliens would be like, or the way that the way that the way that all these cases use words like technology, um, as if it's some you know just some scale that's measured exactly how people in Silicon Valley on Earth in 2015 in the United States think about it. Um, but before I get um, before I get deeper into my um, my critique, I wanted to go to the second case study. This, we're going to go back in time to uh, the late 19th century. Um, so, in 1877, the astronomer Percival Lowell looked up at Mars and thought that he saw canals. Quote. Girdling the, their globe and stretching from pole to pole, the Martian canal system not only embraces their whole world, but is an organized entity, he wrote, of the features on Mars, which we now know to be an optical illusion based on the way that the eye extrapolates images from blurry pictures. Um, Lowell's claim that there, were, that there were canals on Mars that were built by some intelligent species uh, was actually preceded by a different astronomer, an Italian astronomer named Giovanni Schiaparelli, who was a confidant of Lowell's, and he was the one who'd first speculated about the canals. Um, in, uh, and he was, he was in Italy. Um, here's a picture of, this is Schiaparelli's diagram of what the, what the, uh, the canals look like. Um, and he had, he had names for all the different, all the different lines too, like they, they, they named them all with Latin names. Um, this is this is Percival Lowell's um, drawing. He saw similar but not quite the same things. Um, so if if you know if, if anyone's from Boston, you may have heard the Lowell name because it's they were he was one of what was known as the Boston Brahmins. So one of these like these like aristocratic family. Um, there's a po there's a there's a poem about the Lowell family uh, that you may know. It's like. So this is dear old Boston, the home of the bee and the cod, where the um, where the Lowells only talk to God. Um, <laughs> so Lowell was, as I said, Lowell was a wealthy Harvard-educated Boston aristocrat and heir to a cotton fortune. And rather than just stop at drawing the canals, he went as far as to extrapolate on the nature of Martian society culture, and government, starting from his blurry observations of what he thought was the canal system. Um, he did correctly observe Marge's icy white polar regions, and he proposed that the canals delivered water from the icy poles to the equator, uh, perhaps for agri agriculture. Lowell enlisted the help of sociologist Lester Frank Ward to speculate on the nature of the Martian culture, along with the, the zoologist and American Academy of Sciences inductee Edward Morse to give credence to his speculation. 
the era in which both Lowell and Schiaparelli hypothesized the Martian canals was a time of social upheaval. Um, it was, you know, this was around the era of electrification, combustion engines and trains had become common, um, and imperial Western powers had just begun geological engineering on an unprecedented scale. The Suez Canal and the French's attempt at the Panama Canal were two examples of that. Um, I wish I actually had an image of, I saw an image, but it was, it was too low res to, to give of what Lowell and Schiaparelli actually saw. So if you look at the images to the left of Mars and sort of like squint your eyes at them and see them as fuzzy, that's, that's how they saw it. And then the images on the right are what um, Lowell drew based on that blurred image. So at this, in this era, late 19th century, you know, the Industrial Revolution had driven peasants into urban factory jobs, and there was a lot of revolt and discontent around Europe. Um, Schiaparelli, in Italy, had moved from Italy to Berlin during the 1850s to study astronomy, and he lived in Europe at a time of a lot of social upheaval and a lot of radical politics. Um, so it's interesting because both Schiaparelli and Lowell projected their own class biases, assumption, and historical circumstances on Martian society. So, as I said before, Lowell, being this wealthy scion, he postulated the, Mar the Martians lived in an oligarchic, elitist society where only the fittest, most evolved, and technologically savvy aliens survived the harsh Martian climate. Um, he was a disciple of Herbert Spencer, the conservative philosopher and sociologist whose worldview fit with Lowell's bourgeois politics. On the other hand, Schiaparelli over in Italy, he disagreed with Lowell on what the Martian society would be like. Um, after performing detailed calculations into the nature of Martian irrigation systems, Schiaparelli decided that a Martian society with the organizational capacity construct to construct planet-wide canals would be a plumber's paradise, as he called it, and would probably also be a, quote, paradise for socialism. Um, if you can read Italian, uh, his paper is really, really funny. I mean, his sort of speculations about it being a socialist paradise um, and or, or, you know, how organized it must be to have all these canals is, is pretty good. What year was that? That was, in, that was like 1885. Um, as a side note, the reason that this uh, um, line of thinking didn't go on for much longer was because optics got good enough that they could see they were wrong by like 1900, 1910. And Lowell went to, his, went to his grave thinking that there were canals on Mars, even though astronomers had started to figure out it wasn't the case. Um, okay, so now the third case study, this is another modern one um, about the alien megastructure. So this tendency that I've been describing to project the dominant worldview of one's era into the stars is epitomized by this recent surge of excitement over a very <coughs> peculiar distant star named KIC 8 Four six two eight five two. It's kind of a boring name. Um, at least one journalist in the Atlantic hailed this as the most mysterious star in the galaxy, over speculation as to whether its peculiar flux hinted that it could cause what the media termed an alien megastructure. So a little bit of background to explain what was happening here from an astronomy perspective. Um, the way that um, planets outside of our solar system are image or one, one way of figuring out that there are extra, what are called extrasolar planets, so planets orbiting another star, um, is uh, to look at the light emitting from a star and observe if the amount of light that you pick up dims periodically. And if it does it at regular intervals, that's an indication that our perspective of um, that star is right in the same plane that a planet is orbiting it. And, um, it has to be quite regular, though, I mean, for the sort of evidence to line up. And actually, in this previous slide, that, um, that image right there, the flux of the star over time, that's, that's what this looks like when, you, when a planet is, is found imaging another star. So one is like 100% of the star's normal output. And then you can see in this extremely predictable way, each one of those dots is an observation. Um, it dipped from 100% to about 99.94%. Um, so it's a really small amount of um, change in how much light it emits. 
so hundreds of planets have been observed using this, this method of looking at, looking at how they're eclipsed, uh, most by the Kepler satellite. Um, so Kepler observed recently this star with a really weird light dip pattern, which fit no model. Um, and it was way too irregular to constitute a planet. Uh, this is what that flux looked like on the screen. So rather than go from 100% to 99.94% and back up to 100, it dipped down to 80% at one point. Um, and, it's, and, and it periodically has these dips that are not regular. They don't fit any model of the planet, at least. Um, so when this, when this came out, um, some commentators and scientists started asking whether the star's flux could have been caused by an orbiting alien-made object. Um, the object was soon termed the alien megastructure by sensationalist journalists and bloggers. Um, the speculative idea that a megastructure might be orbiting KIC 8462852 emerged only from the evidence of an irregular flux change in the light curve, which obeyed no scientific model. And from that, a fantastic leap of logic was made, reified in the public eye through article and online buzz, fixated on the idea that there may be a massive solar collector array, also known as a Dyson sphere, orbiting the star. So I had some quotes from different popular magazines. Sky and Telescope um, um, talked about this citizen science program that helped, uh, helped find this, or helped reveal this weird thing going on in the star. Um, actually, I'm going to skip over this and this. Yeah, OK, here's from, here's from Earth Sky. Um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a quote from them about, about the star. What is an alien megastructure? If we as a civilization could collect all of our sun's energy, we do it with some sort of megastructure, otherwise known as a Dyson sphere or a Dyson shell. So what is, what is a Dyson sphere? So the idea, this idea of a Dyson sphere originated in a paper in 1960 um, called Search for Artificial Stellar Sources of Infrared Radiation by a physicist named Freeman Dyson, who speculated whether an advanced civilization, he used that, that term, advanced civilization, whether an advanced civilization might build millions of orbiting solar panels enough to eclipse the light from their entire star so that 100% of its solar energy might be harnessed for the sake of the civilization. Hence the idea that the periodic dip in the star's light curve could have been caused by an orbiting solar panel megastructure akin to a Dyson sphere. Um, and I have, let's see, I'm going to skip forward a couple. Here's a picture from um, the Atlantic um, showing what a Dyson sphere might look like. So this idea is that you would, the entire star would be eclipsed with like solar panels that would sort of move around and um, you wouldn't see the star anymore because it would be completely covered and the civilization would have gotten all the energy from it. Um, the notion that energy harnessing of this magnitude would be commonplace among alien civilizations has become a hegemonic tenet of many scientists and SETI thinkers, so much so that there is a classification system to describe hypothetical aliens based on their ability to harness energy, a system known as the Kardashev scale. Uh, in an article about the scale, journalist George Zavorsky writes, Kardashev's scale has been expanded and reintegrated to include more than just the capacity for communications technology. Astrobiologists and cosmologists now use the scale to simply describe the amount of energy available to an extraterrestrial intelligence for any purpose. As a result, the scale is often used to speculate, speculate about the kinds of technologies and existential modalities that characterize advanced civilizations, that term again, the Kardashev scale rent, divides planetary civilizations into three types, type one, two, and three. Type one civilizations are at a technological level close to the level presently attained on Earth. Um, a type one is, is, is typically associated with a civilization that's harnessed all the power available to it in its home planet. As physicist Michio Kaku has said, it's a planetary scale civilization that can control earthquakes, the weather, and volcanoes. It will have taken advantage of every inch of space and build cities on the ocean. For a civilization to attain type one status, therefore, it needs to capture all of the solar energy that reaches the planet and all other forms of energy it produces as well, like thermal, hydro, wind, ocean, and so on. Um, correspondingly, a type two civilization has harnessed all the energy from its local star with Dyson spheres, probably. <laughs> 
whereas the type three civilization has harnessed all the energy from its local galaxy. So here was three artist renderings of the type one, two, and three civilization. Um, and uh, so this speculation seemed like a non-intuitive projection of Western culture onto the observational data from one star. What kind of civilization might project that it would one day need so much energy as to encompass 100% of one star? It would have to be an unsustainable civilization that consumed energy resources at an exponential rate and incorporated this lust for energy into its social doctrine, a civilization whose consumption was rapacious, a civilization that valued production more than anything else, with no concern for the environment or conservation, and finally, a civilization willing to strip mine and destroy entire planets in its quest for energy. In short, probably not a democratic society or civilization. Um, so, Stuart Armstrong is a physicist at Oxford who proposed that this, it might be an easy, it, he, he proposed that uh, it may be there is a simple way for humanity to build a Dyson sphere. Um, in this lecture, which I really recommend you go look at, because it's, it's kind of crazy how everybody in the audience thinks this is such a normal idea. In this lecture called von Neumann probes Dyson spheres exploratory engineering in the Fermi paradox, Armstrong explained that creating a Dyson sphere around the sun would be relatively quote easy, though it would require the complete destruction and dismantling of the planet Mercury. Armstrong structures his lecture as a series of seemingly logical assumptions that flow from one another. One, that humans would want to colonize the galaxy. Two, that there would be political will to destroy the planet of Mercury in order to build solar collectors and harness energy. And three, that we would have the robotics technology to automate much of the process. Armstrong emphasizes the simplicity of it, and I quote, we could do it now. We could get to Mercury, put some solar panels on it, get some mining stuff, and get the whole procedure done. The question is if we could automate it and have the factories built. So this repeated use of this term, advanced civilization, which I think is interesting in so many of these different scientists use it, it's very, I, th I find it highly subjective and biased. Um, it assumes that civilizations in the future would follow the same energy-hungry model that our own has for a very brief time period. And yet the deterministic path that led scientists and futurists to conclude that the Kardashian scale is a good way to typify alien civilizations, or that a Dyson sphere is a logical policy and industrial outcome of an advanced civilization is so accepted that it drives policy. Um, here on campus, um, Dr. Anthony Aguirre, who's a cosmologist and directs something called the Foundational Questions Institute, which is similar to SETI, um, said that his foundation funds research into, quote, seeing if there are distant stars that have been, been manipulated by an alien intelligence. Aguirre, too, was convinced that aliens could have imperialist aims. Quote, if we tapped into some kind of interstellar communication stream between aliens, I would suggest that we don't interfere or make ourselves known, he said. Now, I find it hard to imagine that a democratic, pluralistic society lacking a rigid authoritarian command structure would undertake such an industrial and ecologically intensive project as mining the entire energy resources of our planet or destroying mercury to build solar collectors around the sun. Um, but I can see that these might be logical scenarios if we were to project our own capitalist, imperialist civilization way into the future, um, assuming that our current industrial and cultural practices were something innate natural to all intelligent life rather than a specific short-lived historical moment. Um, so if we project to the future, it's worth asking of where we live in our own culture, um, which is the only intelligent life we know of in the universe, what kind of human civilizations would last millions of years long enough to contact or be contacted by other intelligent life? Well. I think most of us would agree, probably not a capitalist one. As a social and economic model, uh, late capitalism is energy hungry, competitive, xenophobic, oppresses people, ravages the planet, and sources for, in search of resource and wealth for a few. It's not a good long-term model for any civilization, human or alien. So why is this important? It's because if we want to hold on to the hope of meeting other alien civilizations, one would think it would be interest of, of our own to survive long enough to make that discovery. Uh, the Milky Way is 150,000 light years across. It could take hundreds, thousands, or tens of thousands of years to have a two-way conversation. 
a civilization capable of this feat might be a stable, peaceful, cooperative one. So, um, a society that wields and defines technology as these scientists and thinkers do is in no way a given. I think technology in this instance is a construct, an idea inherent to Western civilization, which was born out of a very particular set of historical accident, accidents that were in no way inevitable, not on Earth and not on any other planet. Um, there's also an interesting uh, Orientalist take on this, to use like Edward Said's theories about this. Um, both Edward Said and Robert Marx have noted that ethnocentrism inherent to positioning Western culture as the pinnacle of human civilization. The rise of the West is a story, to be sure a story at the core of Eurocentrism, writes Marx, and the political, economic, and military dominance of Europe and its offshoots was not inevitable. The classical British political economists, Adam Smith, Thomas Malthus, and David Ricardo, developed another strand to be woven into the story of the rise of the West. The ideas of capitalist development is progress, the West is progressive, and Asia, and by implication Africa and Latin America too, as backward and despotic. So, by positioning Western culture as inherently progressive, the definition of technology, which is a very peculiar and specific term with subjective meaning within the context of Western culture, is poisoned in that it links, it's linked intrinsically to the same set of Western values and the same continuum of capitalist development coded as progress. To make assumption about alien technology is to deprive the alien civilizations of their own history and culture and impose our own, specifically the culture of the West. Uh, but beyond that, it reflects techno-capitalist hegemony and our, the tendency for us to impose our own cultural tendencies on supposed aliens, as if capitalism and Western values extended across the universe. Which, in this context, makes sense that in 2015 that this group of scientists and CEOs with no empirical evidence about any alien culture can make brazen, culturally biased assumptions about aliens and be taken seriously when really they see themselves in the aliens. Fear of ET as invasive colonists presupposes the idea that aliens have no culture or history of their own. They are merely an anonymous imperial horde. Andrea Smith has written of the racial logic of Orientalism as marking certain peoples or nations as inferior, imposing a constant threat to the well-being of an empire. Certain racial and ethnic groups, she writes, will be seen as civilized, even as they are imagined as permanent foreign threats to empire. Replace people with aliens, you start to see Orientalist parallels in the way that aliens are conceived. So, um, oh no, my slides changed to black. Um, let me see if I can just, uh, I don't know if that happens. Let me just change the font color really quick, sorry about that. This is my last slide. Sorry about that. So um, I actually have, out of all this, a, 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 believe it or not, a, a policy recommendation. Um, so in, in the search for extraterrestrials, um, astrobiologists and SETI Institute thinkers and have, have enlisted the help of biologists on Earth uh, to think about the biological possibilities for alien life. Um, even though we only know about life on our own planet, uh, there's a wide, a great diversity of life on Earth. Um, and astrobiologists often write of extremophiles, and this is an example of the diverse conditions under which life thrives. Um, there's this little funny chart that I found on, on, on the web of, of kind of his thinking goes when scientists are thinking about extremophiles. It's like there's, um, there's bacteria and cyanobacteria that live deep in the deepest parts of the, of the ocean. Um, Often, often that are uh, get their energy not from photosynthesis but but from uh, chemosynthesis, um, and likewise there's there's life that lives in the hot streams in Yellowstone, um, Antarctica, um, in the Arctic, in the driest parts of Earth, and this little graphic that was made by this astronomy website has Europa with a question mark, which is, <laughs> sort of typifies this type of thinking, which is like if um, <coughs> If there's extremophiles that can live in all these different types of conditions, um, maybe life could live on planets that don't exactly look like Earth, but look like maybe these parts of Earth, maybe look like the Atacama Desert or look like Antarctica or something like that. 
So studying this diverse array of extremophile life and extrapolating from there drives a search for ET, and it gives insight into how life might be on diverse planets. So here's a question and policy recommendation is why haven't the people at the SETI Institute considered they might do the same with culture? Um, Western late capitalism has not existed for very long, and given its rapacious need for resources and exploitation to continue existing, it seems unlikely to be a long-term model for any species. Uh, its emergence as the dominant cultural and economic system on Earth was not inevitable either. So project, project, projecting the future of neoliberal capitalism into space and far into the future is not a great tactic for finding aliens. A better one might be to enlist the help of anthropologists to look at non-Western cultures and economies, both historic and present, and then consider how these cultures might look and interact if they were the dominant one on Earth, and then perhaps one day expand into the stars. Um, this would certainly entail new things to look for in space and new tactics for communication, uh, new places to look and new bandwidths. Um, so, yeah, that's that's basically uh, that's that's thanks for listening.